Mark McKenna, and I'm going to quickly introduce our panel because we're all here to make sure that we have enough money in retirement and we can all spend our winters in Florida, right? So I don't want to eat up all of our time um, introducing our, um, our panelists with their long bios. We'll learn all about them as we go along here. But I do want you to know who we're going to be hearing from this morning. We have Karen McIntyre from Westcott Financial Advisory and Constance Hairstrom from Premier Financial Planning and Ajay Kais from Kai Advisors. Hello. And so I'm going to turn it over to our panelists to take it from here with three um, very experienced financial planners who can give us a lot of guidance and wisdom today about how to plan for our financial futures. So thank you, thank well, thank you, very you. Much. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to put this slide up. My name is Ajay. Welcome. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, I hope uh, each of you walks away with at least one or two things you did not know about before you entered the room. But that's my gauge, maybe it's a low bar, but that's my bar for attending a conference session. So I hope that works for you. Uh, the information that you're going to find out today is, uh, it, for me, was very important when I first found it out, and I hope it's the same for you. I just put a slide up here because this is a slide from a BlackRock study that's actually up on their homepage. If you go to www.blackrock.com, you'll find uh, how do women invest, and you click on the link, you'll come to a slide just like this. And it talks about some of the differences between women and men in terms of of financial earnings and retirement. And I thought it was a, it was a very uh, interesting slide, especially this part four. And I thought if you had to take away something uh, as a smart saver, uh, if you're not exhibiting any of these four behaviors, you may want to take a look at that. So uh, that's you know something that I, that I put up there. And having said that, I'm actually going to uh, hop into the presentation. Uh, And, uh, and, and, and I'm going to leave the introductions to, to when, when each panelist speaks. Uh, and the topic for today is personal financial planning. Similar to uh, when you enter a flight, when you, when you board a plane, we want to make sure we're in the right road. So today's uh, topic is about personal financial planning. And, uh, and I hope uh, you all find something val uh, valuable from it. I just wanted to set the stage for where we are in terms of expectations, what we're expecting to learn from the session today. This was in the agenda, so I just want to reiterate. Re re uh, the, the first the part of it which I'm going to address is going to be on what the financial planner landscape looks like. And I'm sure, and I, I'll, I can have a bet with anybody of you in the room, that by the time you walk out of this room, you'll get new important knowledge in that area. Because uh, I think 90% of the people that I meet uh, do not actually know the various flavors of financial planners out there and therefore cannot actually select the best one for them. So that's, that's the part that I'm going to address. Uh, Karen, to my right, is going to address what financial planning is, which is also another area that I feel most consumers have uh, don't have full knowledge about, and they should, because it actually encompasses a whole lot of different things rather than just meeting a retirement goal or just having so many, so many dollars in assets or, uh, or, or just having this type of an insurance product. So, it's a lot more, and, and Karen is going to address that part. And the third part that, that Connie is going to address is investment planning, because we all know that the investments that we are able to contribute to and the growth of those investments is going to be a large part of meeting our goals, whether they're retirement goals or you know, people have all types of goals, funding their kids' education, whether it's uh, uh, buying a second home and so on and so forth. So those are the way that, that's the way that we've split it up. And, um, and we're going to uh, we're make this interactive. I, I hope you have some audience participation and questions. Uh, that would be very welcome. So without further ado, uh, let me just hop into the financial planner landscape. Uh, did you know uh, that there is a qualification for being called a financial planner? And it's this number. It's this thing. <laughs> Any one of us in this room or outside uh, can call ourselves a financial planner because there is no regulation as to what a financial planner is. And that, in my mind, is a little bit of an unfortunate situation because uh, there are various stripes of financial planners just like there are various stripes of all other, all other professionals. Some are good, some may not be good for them. But as a consumer, you should know. And so the goal for this particular topic is to sort of uh, give you some clarity on that. So you might hear of the term financial advisor, financial consultant, wealth manager, wealth advisor, insurance agent, broker, confusion reigns supreme. And um, the requirements are none, but if you need to sell a product, Wall Street is about selling products, about mutual funds and insurance uh, products, 
if you need to sell a product, you need to pass an exam. It's called a series seven or series 63, the series exams. Those are examinations you pass to sell products. In my mind, those are not qualifications. But um, that's what you need to be to be one of one of a, one, one of a financial planner certification. So there are 300,000, that's a large number, 300,000 financial planners in the United States. They work for companies like Northwestern Mutual or Merrill Lynch or Ameriprise and some small, smaller firms that you may not have heard of, such as ours. We are all financial planners. How do you get from 300,000 to some number that's more manageable for you to interview and to find out about? I think the first filter should be somebody who's a certified financial planner. And that certification is important because uh, it at least allows you to know you're dealing with somebody who has met and continues to meet four requirements. And those are the four E's of being a certified financial planner. There's a minimum education requirement, thank God. There's a minimum ethics <laughs> requirement, thank God even more. There's an examination requirement and there's an experience requirement. So those are, those are sort of good, good filters. This brings down 300,000 people to 60,000. There's 60,000 certified financial planners in the United States. Is that sufficient? I would say no. And the reason I would say no is many certified financial planners actually work for some of the firms that sell products, which is okay. However, in the same conversation with the certified financial planner, you might be getting advice, which is what a certified financial planner is ethically bound to do, advice. But in the same conversation, you may also be getting sold a product. And that may or may not be in your good it may not may or may not be in your best interest. So in my mind, it's not sufficient that you deal with just a certified financial planner. You need to deal with a certified financial planner who goes beyond uh, that certification to somebody who always acts as a fiduciary to you. This is a big word. Most consumers may have heard about it, but they don't really know how to deal with it in a transaction. So when you meet a certified financial planner or an investment advisor, one key question to ask is, will you be a fiduciary to me in every transaction that you engage me with or in? And that's important because then you know that they are always acting in your best interest versus many brokers who may or may not be acting in your best interest. I can't paint everyone with the same stroke, but often it's about selling a product and making a commission for themselves or their firm that drives the transaction. And that's really important because the standard is a different Standard. It's a lower standard. It's a suitability standard that the broker engages in. A fiduciary engages in a fiduciary standard, which is a higher bar about always acting in the client's best interest. And that's important because I'll show you a slide that talks about what the difference is. Uh, some terms in the financial planning landscape. Uh, you may have heard of fee-based because that's become a little more of a common term uh, in, the, in the world. But fee-based is not fee-only. Fee-based is actually the worst of both worlds. A fee-based planner is somebody who can have a conflict of interest but can also charge a fee. So I think in my mind, you ought to be considering somebody who has very little or no conflict of interest in terms of the financial planning landscape. We talked about why a fiduciary is important and we talked about why the difference, what the difference is between a broker, agent, and a fiduciary. And the reason that's important is, everyone's heard about the fat cats on Wall Street, right? And the bonuses, the fat does not come from, from, from thin air. It actually, if you think about it a little deeply, uh, it comes from the products that we are sold and the cost of those products. Often that is hidden. So um, when you buy a mutual fund or you buy an insurance policy or, or your financial advisor talks to you about those, there is a component of those that's a, a legitimate expense ratio. It's the cost of doing business. But often there's a component in there that actually goes back as a hidden fee to the broker and or to the company that's engaging that transaction. And if it's a 2% difference on an annual basis, that makes a 75% difference in your net wealth when it's accumulated over a 30 year period. That's Einstein's eighth wonder, book, the law of compounding. <laughs> most, well, not most, I would say, all fee only planners and fiduciaries would rather have that difference come to you rather than go to somebody else. So, this is a real important reason. And if I look at my, I'll give you a quick anecdote. You know, I actually worked on Wall Street uh, for seven years, and then it's only four years after I left that I met by fluke a fee-only planner, and she said she was a fee-only planner, and I said, a what planner? And that was in 2004. And, and, and I hope that, uh, you know, that, that, the, that the first topic at least has helped, uh, helped you understand what the difference, uh, difference, type of difference in planners is and 
why the word fee only fiduciary should be very meaningful to you and that's those are words that you should remember in your conversations with potential uh, clients that you might choose to engage with why this is more important to women and one particular statistic here was shocking to me which is this number here but we do know that women tend to live longer than men. In fact, if you're a 35-year-old woman today and you buy an insurance policy, the insurance actuary tables have you living out to 100 or 102, and men to 95 to 97. So, you know, the, as, as life expectancy is increasing. But the number that was shocking to me, the average age of widowhood in the United States is 56. That's a very, very low number. We, we, we know the high divorce rate. And we also know these last two topics are sort of linked together. Um, not only is there is there a little bit you know of, of, of lack of education if you wish in terms of finances personal financial planning but also they get many people either get or are bombarded with advice from salespeople who are there to sell a product rather than actually provide advice although they can still call themselves an advisor so that's uh, um, so you here is a graph of 60,000 certified financial planners there are 20,000 registered investment advisors, which are fiduciaries, who are, who are fiduciaries to you. And there are about 2,000 fee-only planners. There may be a little more, because there are one or two organizations other than NAPFA that are fee-only planning organizations. A few of us belong to NAPFA here. But if you have a room of 200 people, in my opinion, you need to find that one person out of 200 who you should at least interview in your quest to find a good financial planning relationship. Because they are the ones who are most likely to provide advice to you that is in your best interest. They will charge you a fee for it because everyone wishes it was free only, but it's not. It's fee only. But uh, I mean, I think this should be uh, an illuminating insight. So, the end of my end of my part of the presentation is, you know, how do I look for a financial planner? And that was what I hoped that the audience would, would benefit from. So, look for a planner with expertise, and I would say at least a certified financial planning designation is is important there. Objectivity, in my mind, a fee only planner is the most objective planner that you can find, that one can find. Full disclosure, always acting as a fiduciary for you in every transaction that they advise you on, which means that considering your best interest rather than their own interest in mind. And then the softer skills, chemistry, communication, accessibility, likability, trust, style of business. They may be fee only planners who work with larger firms, smaller firms, solo practitioners, quality of life issues with you. And cost is what you pay because you will pay a fee, but value is what you'll get. And this value is tremendous. Uh, and, and, and I would rather see my clients getting most of this than any other party. And then lastly, I would say to every person that deals with you in a financial transaction as, as, your, um, as your trusted advisor, have them sign a statement. In every single transaction, I will always act as a fiduciary to you. And you will see very quickly how the number of people drops down dramatically from your initial uh, in initial conversation. So this is, this is really important. But that's the end of my part. This, these are some uh, sources, resources on how to find a, a, a financial planner. This is the NAPFA website, the POD network website, CFP website, there's a guide link there. And then one thing that people often forget is, look at the SEC advisor search and the FINRA broker search for your financial agents. Make sure that they don't have any red marks there. You'll be surprised as to how many people give presentations just like I am and actually have red marks in, in, in those two areas. And also Google them. This is wonderful information. Will the slides be available to us? And, and I will make sure that Hopkins provides the, the alumni network puts the slides up. It's a good question. Uh, Marta, do you have an answer to that? Please I don't have, have an answer to it, but I'll try to find an answer. Was, but if not, uh, our contact information is at the end of the slides, and Great. I, I hope Hopkins is able to get it to you. Otherwise, at least my contact, our contact information should be available to them, and I'll be happy to send them to you. Thank you. Yes. So I never heard the distinction before between fee only and fee based. Mm -hmm. So can you go through that like sure. one more time? What's what's wrong with fee based? Okay. So so the traditional advisory world, the traditional financial planning world, was based on commissions, where you went to a place like Ameriprise or Merrill Lynch, and and you, you did a transaction with them and you thought you were not paying a fee because it was actually coming out of a product that they are selling you. Right? That's the commission-based work. Or you buy an insurance policy where often your first year premium is actually a commission to the agent and or the company and then you pay that for six or seven years for your premium. You don't know that as a consumer. I would guarantee you when you bought an insurance policy or when you bought a mutual fund, your financial advisor did not explain that to you. And that's fee-based. That was, that, was, that was commission, commission only. Okay. 
So when the fee-only planner world came into being in the early 80s in that period, uh, which was a fee-only planner will not accept any income from any other source other than a fixed fee from their client for advice that they give them in their best interest. Those were fee-only planners. When Wall Street and the machine saw this little group of people, they invented this term called fee-based. So if you go to a fee-based planner, they can charge you a fixed fee, such as a percentage fee for managing your account, but they can also earn all what we call the dirty, dirty fees in the industry, commissions, trailers, sub-tiers, they're all 12 day one fees. So fee-based, in my mind, is actually the worst of both worlds, because the client thinks they're getting fee only, but they are actually getting a fee and potentially some of the dirty fees in the business and commissions. Good, good question. I hope that clarifies, clarifies the answer. Any other questions before I before I pass the the, the baton or in this case the clicker onto onto a Karen for finance the financial planning part? Thank you so much. What you've heard so far is that we believe that the fee only practice is the best way to go. I fell into being a financial planner in a fee only firm in 1992. I I didn't even know that financial planning existed. I was a psychologist. A psychology major, I'm a therapist, and realized I liked the numbers too, and I was trying find, to find a place to put it all together, and lo and behold, financial planning did that for me. And I decided at the end of my first week that this is what I was going to do for the rest of my life, and I've never looked back. And I work for a, a larger firm in the city of Philadelphia, and we also have uh, presence in Coral Gables and some other offices around the country. But what we all do, regardless of what our firm is like, is that we all follow the process of financial planning. There is a very distinct and repeatable process. And the reason that this is in place is that we need to know who our clients are, what their needs are, so that we can be their fiduciary. So the first thing we want to know is who are you from a numbers perspective and who are you just from the qualitative perspective? Do you have children? Do you are you working in a position that you're like? Are you that you like? Do you um, have ability to save? Do you have to be mindful of your parents' needs? Do you have children who are still dependent on you, even if they're 25? Um, do you have other objectives that might be competing, like funding long-term goals and objectives like retirement, as well as paying for college costs for your children? So we we gather a lot of information, both quantitatively and qualitatively, and then we um, analyze and evaluate the material that you've provided us. And there's a lot of back and forth so we can make sure that this advice is unique to you and your needs. What I think is crucial is that there are a lot of um, talking heads saying, at this age you need to have this much in stocks, or this is the right thing for you. And I, and I think that those people do a disservice to the general public because what's right for you may not be right for your kid <coughs> who seems to be exactly like you. You know, you both may be a particular age, you both might have the same number of children uh, at the same age, however, you might have a very different earning capacity and spending need, and even appetite for risk. So the, the objective for both of you will be very different, and what we each do is provide a very unique set of recommendations dependent on our client's unique circumstances. So that recommendation is usually based on, not usually, is based on what is right for you. So for example, if someone says, I, I hate debt, it keeps me up at night, don't even talk to me about a mortgage, well, I'm gonna talk to them about the trade-offs if they've decided not to have a mortgage. And on the other hand, if someone says, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I don't have any problem using a mortgage because I know rates are really low right now and I can maximize my resources if I put more money away for the long term of the investment mutual funds, stocks, bonds, whatever, well, our, our advice will be very different. So we make these recommendations, we then implement those recommendations on our client's behalf, and then we monitor those circumstances if there are changes, like somebody gets married, changes a job, wants to retire, graduates college, et cetera. The kinds of things we talk about, I, bless you, I consider myself my client's personal CFO. So any financially related topic that might come up, I want my client to call me. Do I buy or lease a car is the, is the simplest of simples, but then it's, you know, for those corporate execs, I've got stock options. What do I do? How do I manage my income taxes? Or I have, again, competing objectives. I want to buy a house. I have student loan debt. 
and I want to save for retirement. So the, that's the, the goal setting, planning priorities, and, and projections are all based on what's important to you. But these are the kinds of things retirement, education, charitable needs that it might apply to. Cash flow optimization is important, not just for those who are in the years where they need cash flow from their portfolio, but also <coughs> while you're in your accumulation phase to make sure that you're spending and saving in the right uh, destinations and wherever you're spending that we think about income tax minimization strategies. And each of these um, circumstances are all interrelated. I can't talk about any one without thinking about the other. Risk management would be things like life insurance, health insurance, disability insurance, long-term care insurance, maybe not for you, but maybe for your parents, and um, making sure that any exposures you might have, which by the way could also be from an estate planning perspective for those of us who might be in blended families. You know, you might want to make sure that the surviving spouse has whatever they need to live on, but then you want your financial resources to pass to your kids. <coughs> or you might think about um, maybe a sibling or a child who has married someone that you're not so sure you really like, and you want your family money to stay in the family bloodline. So there are a lot of different things that we can think about that uh, address these circumstances. And then once we know who our clients are from each of these various areas, we then develop an investment portfolio that is right for them to meet their objectives and satisfy their tolerance for risk. The way that you could receive this advice is very diverse. And you know the three of us represent different um, business plans in terms of how we interact with our clients. You might be able to um, have an ongoing and continuous relationship where we're essentially on retainer for whatever comes up. Or you could say, well, I just need help with this one thing, and there are advisors who do that. Um, you might just want financial planning to make sure that you're well situated. Maybe you have a very specific income tax need, but maybe, or maybe you're just in your wealth accumulation years, you're just starting out, you really don't have investments to speak of. So, you know, we don't want to not let that person get uh, set off on the right path. So that's a very important matter. So you've got financial planning, you've got investment management, and you've got wealth management, which is putting everything together. It's basically the financial life management or serving as your personal CFO. And again, it can be subject specific or very comprehensive. And that can ebb and flow as time goes on. While all of us have transparent fees, you know exactly what you're paying and when, the way we are all compensated, and I'm talking about fee-only financial planners, can be different. You can pay for hourly services, you can pay on a retainer, you can pay based on assets under management, and that's a percentage in the, let's just call it one to two percent range because it depends on the assets that you ask for help on. There's a variety of ways. And it all, um, all of that is available information before you engage with your fee-only financial advisor. <laughs> but, but before we do that was the complexity of comprehensive financial planning and the interrelationship between the different areas including investment management but also including things like estate planning or insurance planning or tax planning or college planning if you have college planning kids and how these all come together because each of them actually does have an impact that can be positive if it's handled that way on your entire financial picture. So it's really important to look at it from a holistic uh, plan. And that's something a fee-only planner, you're likely to get uh, better advice from a fee-only planner compared to, you, you'll often see in the non-fee-only world, now you get something that looks like a financial plan and they'll churn it through a piece of software that will produce some recommendations and they'll call it a financial plan. But if you look at it, it's actually truly not a financial plan that's best suited to you. It's a the series. only unique thing on that is your name. It's your it's name. It's boilerplate thing. And there'll be a series of recommendations. So you have to be careful because you know it's it's buyer beware and caveat emptor in, in this in this world. So so so, so thank you, Karen, for that really uh, good overview of financial planning. Are there any questions in financial planning before we move on to investment planning? Yeah, please. I have a question about um, business owners. If you are my personal CFO, my company has a CFO, how do you uh, communicate, relate, or is it one and the same person, or how does that it, it could be or may not be dependent on who your advisor is, but I would say if it's not the same person, um, there would be overlap, and we should all be sitting around the table together thinking about how we construct 
the best guidance and advice for you, the individual, and you, the business owner, and then make sure that every bit of area that overlaps is being addressed. Yes. Um, so since fee only planners have um, different ways that they're paid, is you said that we can view that before engaging. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we should be looking at for? Well, Ajay mentioned that you have information available to you if you go on those various websites to learn more about us. We all file what's called an ADV, which is our governmental filing that dictates who we serve, how we serve, and the fees that are billed. ADV. <laughs> I also have, you know, the best way to actually find out is to ask the person in the interviews how are you going to get compensated for the services that you are most interested in. And then you can, you know, my advice is to interview at least two or three different planners. In my mind, they should all be few only planners, but two, at least two or three different planners and really ask them the question, how are you going to get compensated with how you work for me? And I, I have some additional feedback with respect to your business question. Do you, you have anything to add to any of the questions that are asked? Or, because I okay. So you know, the, when you're a small business owner, you know, your personal network is very much connected with your business network. And it's sort of, if you think about the comprehensive financial planning picture that, that, that Karen presented up there in terms of the different elements, business owners are also a part of that a, a part of that picture. And the interrelationship between your business income and business profit and your personal network is very interconnected. So I think it's even more important to consider, for example, what are the best retirement plans, not only for myself, but if I have any employees in my business, because depending on the right type of plan, you can actually, and, and the cash flow in the business, you can actually make a significant positive impact to your network and minimize your taxes. Yes. I have a question. I sure. was actually recently introduced to a financial planner who has the fiduciary um, designation. Or is it a designation? It's actually it's not a designation. Okay. Although it's there is a designation called okay. AIF. Okay. That is a fiduciary. Well, okay. So he's taking that for Series 6. Yeah, those are not fiduciaries. Really? Okay. Those are, if you do a Series 6, Series 7, Series 63, those are FINRA broker okay. brokerage designations. Okay. Make sure if he says okay. to you, he or she says to you that they are a fiduciary, ask them to send you a sign. Have, have them sign something okay. or send you some document on an official letter and saying they're lacking the fiduciary to you in every transaction. Okay. It is very unusual, although not impossible, for a person who acts for a brokerage to be a fiduciary. Yeah, it is okay. very unusual. Because what, so as we were talking and I was asking him more about his affiliations, he says that he gets paid, he, you, that I don't, I would not pay him directly. So he He's would not, not be a the only person. He gets paid if he, based on the products that he actually gives me to purchase. So, so just think about that a little bit. Yeah, deeper. right. How can so you be that's why I'm trying to listen here. Yeah. See, you will define fee-based and fee-only. He's you needed one of those. Commission. He's commissioned. Yeah, commissioned. With the, and so how could he really truly act in my best interest if he's commissioned? You asked the right question to me. <laughs> <laughs> Are you need to ask it to them, right? Yeah. 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 But in my mind, if you do, you should ask them, how are you getting paid and how much are you getting paid on this? So you can make some sort of evaluation on whether this is worth it for you and whether your dollars are being best spent because it's going to come out of your pocket. It's not coming out of nowhere. Then you sign. Do you have to sign with someone who has that you've locked into that person? Is there a commitment from your part? In other words, it's like, if you don't like them, can you change them and say, I don't like you, are not doing what I like? Or do you actually get locked into a certain year or two year plan or working with them? I'm going to let Connie answer that. Uh, in my experience, you know, it has been if you decide you don't want something, you are free to leave. And if you had a contract that said, here's how many dollars, and you're in the middle of a financial planning contract, and anything that has been spent, the planner would still keep. But after that, you wouldn't be charged if you were trying to stop that in the process. If you had some sort of an agreement that they were managing your money, you can stop 
at any time, and you may have an agreement that says we pay um, in arrears, or do they pay before, you know, a quarter, whatever it is. So you just have to look at the contract on that, but you definitely can get out of a contract. Just to kind of piggyback on that, that there's, at least in the contracting world, like, there's a clause that says either party has the right to live with the exactly. way. So let me tell you from a practical perspective how this occurs. With a fee-only planner as a fiduciary duty, you are unlikely to have any strings attached. But in a non-fiduciary world, I have seen clients who have come to me, prospective clients from places like Merrill Lynch, for example, where they've been tied into products for a longer period of time with high cost to get out. Right? So I would say, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, it may not be better for you to leave a particular situation because of the cost of getting out. You will not find that in the fiduciary fee-only world, but you may find that in the non-fiduciary broker world. Well, that's what I was thinking about, because if you buy a product, if you're working with a planner you know, that's selling product, and you're at Merrill Lynch on that platform, and you say, gee, I really don't like what you're doing, and I, there's tax implications, you liquidate, sure. there's fees that when you change sure. over, so those are the hidden fees, I think that you don't know until you're up against it, I would imagine, that's yeah. why. So a good planner will give you, a, when, you, when there is a situation like that, a good planner will explain the pros and cons and costs of staying versus not staying, and the opportunity cost that you might be losing out in that regard. And a good planner will also minimize any taxes that might be due and avoid them, if possible, on any transitions, because many, there are strategies that one can do without going into detail that would minimize or mitigate them. Any other questions before we move on to the investment planning part, which is also an interesting, very interesting part, because there are many different ways of doing financial plan, of investment management, investment planning. And Connie actually, in her practice, has a focus on uh, on one type of, she's developed expertise in, in one type of investment management, and she, she may talk to you about this during the course of her, of, of, of her, uh, her, her education session on investment planning.